Okay, I guess we can start uh, slowly and, um, you know, um, again, feel free to discuss things with me. We're gonna start a new chapter today. And this is actually one of the main goal of our class, which is basically the interplay between dynamics and PDE. Um, you can certainly, you know, like uh, discuss more with me as time goes. Uh, also, um, if there's anything, there is anything that is unclear, then uh, do let me know. Um, again, uh, there are some some objects that you have seen in the in the lecture notes that I sent to you. Some objects I introduced to you very uh, sort of like uh, in a very uh, unclear way. So I just gave you the objects and say that we have to deal with that. Um, you know, surely there are better ways to explain this, but it's going to be also a little bit long and non rigorous. So I would prefer to give you the objects and we get used to that. And then you see that, you know, the thing's going to be rather related. Okay. Uh, so that's the goal. Before before the chapter, let me make a remark that um, that uh, mostly from now on. So um, so from now on, mostly we're gonna work with x that is in a uh, in a in a standard torus that is uh, d n, which is r n mod z n. Um, or you can think of the problem as a uh, or think of the problem in Rn with uh, Zn periodic, uh, uh, you know, uh, Zn periodic uh, functions in X. Okay, so you can think of the problem either way. Um, I'm just going to do the torus case. Actually, this can be done for a, a more general compact Riemannian manifold. Um, you know, it's going to be more technical and there are certain points that we have to be careful. So, you know, dealing with the torus allows me to avoid those problems. So that's the, that's the remark. And then uh, there's something that I said earlier. On, so there was a question on Piazza that, uh, you know, uh, when dealing with non-compact space, like when we are dealing with Rn and stuff like that, most of the times uh, I need to be careful that I need to put the assumptions that are uniform in X, um, you know, like bounded uniformly continuous uniformly in X or Lipschitz uniformly in X. And uh, so there, there, there was uh, a point like uh, last time that uh, I should have said maybe in a better way um, that, you know, that you have d square in v of l x v is greater than zero uniformly in x, okay, and and local uniform locally uniformly in v, maybe. Uh, oh. So what I mean, what it means is that you can say that uh, uh, that is. You have that infimum of x in Rn, d square v l x v is always greater than zero for for h v in Rn. Okay, but it's not it's not uniformly in v. You know, as v get big, things can you know grow up uh, bigger or smaller uh, depending on the situations or or this is equivalent to the fact that you can say that d square of v l x v is going to be greater than equals to a constant c r greater than zero for v less than equals to r okay so if you are in a bounded domain in in the velocity v then you always have that is uniformly uh, uh uniformly uh, convex but as v grows it's not clear um, in fact, you can relax the assumptions for x going to infinity a bit, but that's going to be a bit technical, and I, I want to avoid the technicalities here because now we are dealing with with the torus case, so it's compact. So, 
um, that leads to our main goal today. Um, and then again, we're gonna take quite a long time to, to deal with, uh, with um, this chapter, we're gonna enjoy it. So it's really the interplay between dynamics and PDE. And again, feel free to interrupt me to discuss with me on any time. Um, and, and let me say it out loud that, you know, again, we are in a torus uh, uh, and now this is compact, so compact, no boundary. So we don't have to worry about, about, about anything. And, um, and, um, and for a curve, gamma, let's say mapping from, uh, uh, you know, say R to the torus, you can think of it either, you know, uh, as a curve in TN or a, you know, a curve in RN. Okay, again, but I have to be careful when I say that I think about it as a curve in RN, um, but I, I just want to, to make sure that that's the case. Uh, because when you think about curve in RN, for example, I'm, I'm drawing a two dimensional torus here, T2. So if you have a curve, you know, for example, if you, you know, if, if you draw a curve mapping in, 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 in T2, if it goes like that, then, you know, here, you can either think of its continuation that's going out in, in R2, okay? So that is a curve that you can think of it as a curve in R2 naturally or, or a straight line in R2. But I mean, if you think of it as, as a curve in, 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 in T2, then you have to leave it back to T2, okay? And then, you know, it goes like, you know, you pull back and keep, let it keeps going, okay? So, so, um, so depending on the situations, we're gonna make it clearer, uh, but, um, but for a curve, you can think of it as a curve in, in RN or restricted it to the torus. Okay, that's, uh, that's for now, all right. Um, so the assumptions, the set of assumptions for us is that I'm assuming that L or H are in CK. I have that both of them are super linear. I mean, one implies the other, of course. And then they are locally uniformly convex, either in L or in H, they are the same. Okay. So the main object in this chapter surely are about, as I said, you know, on the one hand, I have the dynamics. Here, you know, by dynamics, I meant either the Hamiltonian ODEs. But Hamiltonian ODE, oops, Hamiltonian ODE is sort of the same as the Lagrangian uh, platform for, you know, for Lagrangian, uh, Lagrangian uh, platforms for, you know, the, the curves gamma and gamma dot, right? If you, uh, you know, consider the the Lagrangian framework, it's equivalent to the Hamiltonian framework. That's what we already discussed last time. But now what I want to say is that this dynamic is actually having a counterpart or, you know, a, a close relations with, with, with a PDE, with a Hamiltonian, Hamilton Jacobi PDE. Okay. And from this Hamilton Jacobi PDE, I also somehow wants to find, also somehow uh, want to find a relation between um, between that and either here or there. Okay, so I want to go back and forth between uh, you know the the new object the PDE to the to to the um, uh, you know dynamics. And as I said earlier, we only uh, dealt with the dynamics. You know. So earlier, only for you know either XP or gamma gamma dot mapping from a you know a finite interval IB to to RN or TN, but now we want we would like to 
to analyze the dynamics, um, you know, for say either XP or gamma gamma dot, you know, either mapping from minus infinity zero to the torus or R to the torus, depending on the situation. So we're gonna try to study the last time behavior and all related properties of, on concerning the dynamics. So, so it's start getting interesting. Okay. So as I said, you know, I'm throwing to you the main object of this chapter, which is a new object. That's the PDE, H of X, uh, DU equals to C. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, um, it's a new object, right? Because so far I haven't, I haven't used this kind of equation at all. We have used a little bit of a local theory for the time dependent Hamilton Jacobi equations. And that is really useful and strongly needed in our uh, regularity results uh, in previous two lectures. Uh, but now I, I suddenly throw to you a, an equation that is only depending on X. So it's a stationary PDE and it's only involve, you know, again, the spatial derivative and it's equals to a constant. So this is, this is totally sudden. Um, and there is no reason why I can explain to you very clearly except one fact that is, you know, um, the point that we knew, okay, so maybe I, I, I wrote it down later, but, uh, but, but what we know is that we know that, um, you know, uh, we have conservation of energy, conservation of energy, like T maps to H of XT, PT from our early explanation. So that means that we always stay on a fixed energy level of the Hamiltonian and uh, say, say if the energy level, level is an, a, a real number C in R, then, then it would be natural. Well, not natural, but it's, it's useful to consider a stationary, stationary here mean or static meaning that it's independent of time, PDE, that H of X, DU X is equal to a constant C in the torus. Okay, so I suddenly throw to you a PDE and, and okay, so, um, and, and again, as I said, C is the energy level, uh, that is for sure. Um, so for the U here is unknown. So U is the unknown. Okay, as I said, you can think of uh, U mapping from the torus to R, or you can think of U mapping from Rn to R, and U is Zn periodic. Uh, that is, you have, you know, uh, u of x plus k equals to ux for any integer vector k. Okay. Again, I'm just throwing it to you, a, a PDE. And believe me, the C is really, a, uh, you know, the energy level, but, but, but u here is, is very mysterious. And, you know, um, for some of you who have seen this kind of U, it occurs in a lot of contexts. Let me list a few uh, that might be relevant to you. Again, it, it doesn't matter if you haven't seen it, but but uh, but this U occurs in in, in a lot of contexts. So so uh, since this PDE occurs in in a lot of contexts. So uh, in in occurs. Uh, in you know either uh, from the classical mechanics or Hamiltonian viewpoint, this is sort of like a canonical transformation. Okay, this I think it's it's uh, it's the first thing. It also occurs in uh, in ergodic theory. 
because if we are doing dynamics here, it also occurs in homogenization theory. And it also occurs in a study of large time behavior. So it's it's all although, although it's a very simple object, but but it occurs in in a lot of contexts. Um, at the end of the lecture, I'll, I'll, I'll describe to you sort of like um, heuristically why it comes from large time behavior. That's the easiest place that I can explain. And by the end of the course, we prove large time behavior results, and that's that's a that's a major point. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see how do we see the interplay between the PD and, and, and the Hamiltonian system. All right. Um, so um, let's look on the left uh, panel. So um, we look at the normal Hamiltonian system x dot equals to dp and p dot equals to minus dh with initial data x0 equals to x0 and p0 equals to p0. Okay. So what's the initial data here? I mean, uh, so we start at a point x0. And then we start with, uh, let's say a, uh, okay, maybe it's a better way to write this. Uh, we start in, in, R, in, in, uh, in TN cross RN, that, that's our starting point, um, the initial data. And furthermore, we assume one more thing is that P naught magically is, is the gradient of the U. Oh, I, I should have said, I assume that you smooth enough. We will discuss about the regularity of you later. It's a very, very tricky issue. But from, from the context of, uh, of study of classical mechanics and other things earlier, people assume that everything is smooth, you know, the canonical, canonical transformation and everything is smooth. So I start with you that is smooth enough C2, okay? And, and, and what is remarkable in the claim below, you can actually think of it as a theorem, is that it turns out that if you start your Hamiltonian OD this way, uh, with X0 is any point, but P0 is the gradient of U at X0, then it turns out that you can, you can find easily that P, uh, the generalized momentum vector is nothing but du of xt. So this is this is really a remarkable, remarkable point, you know. Because assuming that, oh, let, let, you know, maybe in in the proof, assuming that if you know u, you know, magically it's a canon canonical transformation. So magically, if you know it then in order to solve the Hamiltonian system of X and P, those are the two N variables. Uh, so you have two N unknowns. Actually, you don't have to, to solve the whole thing, right? You only have to solve uh, the problem below here. You know, again, if U is known, okay? So maybe, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe let me write that, it down here. So, so a, a very remarkable point is that is that you have a so you have to solve the Hamiltonian system. This is the system of two n unknowns. Okay, so if for some reason we know you right, then uh, then we only have to solve. Uh, the equation for n unknowns. That is, you solve instead of the whole two n equations for the Hamiltonian system, you only have to solve the problem x dot t equals to dph of xt. Instead of pt, you have du of xt and x0 is equal to x0. And this is a, a much easier problem to solve, right? I mean, again, mathematically. Um, so what is really remarkable is that going from two and unknowns to only n unknowns, and 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 that's that's the content of our theorem here. Uh, so the theorem says that if I know u, which is supposedly a canonical transformation, then I would be able to to just just solve this this problem, and then I would be able to show that p the generalized um, uh, 
uh, generalized uh, uh, momentum is nothing but u of xt. Okay. So let's see how do we do it. Uh, you know, um, to do this, then what we need to do is only that um, again everything is smooth and nice enough. So the the trick here is that instead of you know proving a complicated things, you consider um, the problem with x tilde p tilde. So that's x tilde p tilde. So exactly what I wrote here on the left panel, or what I just explained on the right. So again, um, maybe let me remark here. This is this is a problem of two n unknowns, and this is a simple problem of only n unknowns. Okay. Okay. Again, if u is known, and and you know again, as I as I said, p tilde t we consider it to be the u of x t. So our claim now is that we need to show that x tilde p tilde is exactly xp. Okay, once we are able to show that, then we are done, right? Because again, last time we have already shown that we are in a fixed energy level and we have a global licious property and we have, um, you know, everything is nice. We have well closeness, so there's a unique solution xp. Okay, so how do I show this? Um, uh, I would say that there are many ways to do this. You're gonna see a proof later that require less regularity of you. Uh, but now that uh, you, you know, what you have now is that actually not that, not only that you is known, but you have that you is in C2, okay? So it's, it's really smooth enough. Um, then, I don't know, the, uh, that can be more, bad, you know, better in cleaner ways. I'm, I'm just, I'm just doing, you know, in the most basic way. The, the basic way is that I know that PT, uh, I know that P tilde T is D U or X T, right? So I know that uh, P tilde is that. So what, what I, I'm just doing is that I'm just differentiating in, uh, so differentiating X in T, I'm sorry. So I differentiate the equation in T uh, then again, there are two ways to write this one, right? What I'm writing there is that x tilde dot is, I'm thinking of it as a, as a row vector. Uh, so x dot tilde multiply with, uh, with the Hessian of u at x tilde t, right? Multiply with, with, you know, n by n matrix. So that is p tilde, okay? And now you use the fact that x tilde dot is nothing but dph of x tilde du of x tilde, right? So that's 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 what I you you are, you know what we are using is that that two things are the same because of the given ODE for x tilde. So I have that. So I have the formula for p tilde dot, right? So that's the that's the box that we have. Okay. So if you stare that quantity for um for a while, you can sort of see that somehow, you know, that's the product of the, of a, of a row vector with a matrix, but somehow this term occurs if you hit the H, the Hamiltonian in, in the DU slot, right? If you do differentiation in the DU slot and by general that terms occur. Um, so, you know, then that means that somehow you would need to use the PD and differentiate. Okay, then that's exactly the point. So now you come back to the PD, your H of X DU equal to C, which is the fixed energy level. And you take the gradient in X, right? If you take the gradient in X, then what do you have? On the one hand, you know, you differentiate in X, you just have the gradient in X of H of X DU. On the other hand, if you differentiate in P, right? So if you differentiate in P, then you have exactly dPH of X du, right? And then again, that's a that's a, a a a row vector, and then you have to multiply with with the Hessian matrix, right? D square of u. Okay. And then you see that you know exactly that that two terms there, you know. That two terms, you know 
on on the top here and in the bottom here the two terms are exactly the same right so that's ex you know that allows us to conclude that p tilde p dot p tilde dot of t is nothing but this term right these two terms are exactly the same or oh, minus of that i'm sorry i should have the minus size therefore we would be able to conclude that uh, we would be able to conclude that p tilde dot of t is exactly minus the x h okay so we are done and we can conclude that x tilde p tilde solve the same ode and by uniqueness we we can conclude that they are the same and you see that we use strongly the the point that uh, we do use strongly the point that c is a constant here right uh, because again, the equation is independent of time. C, if you show C to be a function in X, then when you take the gradient, then the gradient of C in X would occur, and you wouldn't you wouldn't uh, have this 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 nice uh, identity. So therefore, uh, using C as a constant, that means that we have certain invariance. You know, in this case, uh, the invariance or it corresponds to. Uh, conservation of energy is really important and that's why it has to be a fixed constant when x varies okay so either ways it explained in the pd language that's somehow a an analog of the conservation of energy okay and and we are done and as you see i mean it's really remarkable that uh, that in terms of integrable system integrable language then you can go from two and unknowns to n unknowns. That's that that's amazing. So you know, um, okay. All right. So that's good. Um, now now there's a, another theorem. Okay. So we start with u that is in C two, and you have that h of x du is in in a fixed energy level. Again, don't question me for now. I mean, where is this coming from? Later. <laughs> um, and again, we just show that if you start with if you start with x naught p naught that is x du x naught right, then you would end up with uh, your Hamiltonian uh, flow gonna give you x t du x t right okay so if you start your ODEs your Hamiltonian system with x naught du x naught and you run your Hamiltonian flow. Okay. And this is x zero p zero. Then when you pause at any point x t p t here, it gives you nothing but exactly x t du of x t. Okay, that's that's confirmed. Uh, and in particular, now you start seeing certain uh, invariance and certain dynamical structure. And the invariance and dynamical structure you see here is that the graph of the, the gradient, uh, this is often called the graph theorem. I mean, later on, we're going to do something uh, a lot trickier. But now you have gamma, which is the graph of, uh, so gamma is, is the graph. Of, of the uh, gradient of u. So you take um, x du x, right? So it's it's a graph of two n dimension or whatever. I mean, it's it's a um, it's a graph in two n dimension. So this graph is is invariant under the Hamiltonian flow, and by invariance here, I meant that you know if you if you Take the if you take the Hamiltonian flow of gamma to up to any time is still a subset of gamma. So this is this is what I meant by invariant property, and it's, it's already proved right earlier. I mean it's already in this picture. You start with any point in the in the in the um, in the graph of any any point in gamma, you map to any other point and it's still in gamma. So you start with any point in gamma, you end up with you know all the points that are in gamma and this 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 is correct for you know if you go for um, for any 
t going to even plus or minus infinity doesn't matter okay um so as i said here you know one way to think about this is that again we need to fix the energy level and you see that again this is the, the first lecture of, of the of the of the new chapter so i'm trying to make it slow and clear um and 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 you have certain invariance property as well because because if you start in the graph of gamma you know whatever that means you know so if you start in gamma then you pick a point here then you would go you know you know what i'm drawing here is, is not very precise you know but you are just 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 you know going in in gamma so it's an invariant set um um and for sure that 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 um, you know what we are doing in the above proof so uh, so a key point in the above proof is that is that we use that u is in c2 right so we start with uh, we start with an equation h of x the u of x equals to a constant and because u is c2 though, so this is smooth enough so we can differentiate in x so so take the gradient in x uh, and again let me remind you you would have dx of h of x du plus dp of h of x du again this is being thought of as a row vector multiply with d square of u equal to zero okay and you see that this this is exactly uh this is exactly uh giving us this is minus uh, p dot of t right and then and that's the key point uh, however if you think about the problem in the pd language uh you have that this is a a, a first order equation so this is a uh, first order uh, PDE, right? First order here, I meant that you only differentiate the unknown ones, right? You don't have uh, second derivatives occurring in the in the PDE. So when it's the first order PDE, it's, it's natural that 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 we only need you that is in c1 to make sense of the pde right so a natural again very very pure and very naive question would be that um, that um, the, then the question would be that if we only have that u is in c1 then can we get the same conclusion okay so that's the first thing and it's not clear right i mean from my proof that i presented to you uh at least you know it's it's a very naive proof um very quick but naive by just differentiating anything that you can do um, but when you can't differentiate that then how do we do it so, you know, it turns out it's still correct, but it's harder, of course, okay? Uh, so we're gonna do this this later in, in surely, uh, I'll have to decide when, maybe next or the, the class after that. Um, but um, it's, it's also remarkable that even if U is only C1, we still have the same claim that we still have, you know, the, the, the graph gamma is invariance under the Hamiltonian flow okay um, and this 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 raises a question about about the PDE right so you have the PDE h of x du of x equal to c and as I said you can see that I listed at least four areas that this this PDE comes from and is is a very central object in in many things um, so we are touching this PD very lightly, uh, yet already very interestingly, in the sense that 
it seems that we need to touch the structure of this PD and ask questions about solutions, right? Because you know we have talked about C2 solution and now reducing to C1 solutions. And even up to now, a major question is to understand about the set of all solutions to this equation, this PD. Yeah? So this is still a major question in the field. Uh, so far, it's pretty well understood in the convex case, okay? So I, I, I should have said to you, again, I'm, I'm trying to address to you the big picture here. You can question me or discuss with me. The big picture is that up to this moment, up to, up to today, and is uh, quite well understood. I mean, not totally understood, quite well understood in this sort of pretty much beautiful but abstract sense. There are still lots of concrete questions that are not yet understood, but quite well understood in the convex setting. Okay? So H is convex of H. Okay. However, of course, I mean, in our whole course, we are only talking about convex Hamiltonian, which is of interest because it's coming from the duality in Hamiltonian Lagrangian mechanics. However, this PD itself is also very important in, 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 in other areas in which that you would care about non-convex Hamiltonian. So what I can say is that this is wildly or totally open. <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, you know, it's two sides of the coin, right? You know, unfortunately, but Fortunately, that if you have ideas and you can, can construct the whole theory for it, is that you know it's 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 sort of uh, uh, not not known at all when H is not convex. Okay. Uh, it's remarkable. There are very, very few works on the non-convex case for, for Wickham theory. You know, there's one, two papers on that. Um, but but not, not to the level of understanding the set of all solution to age, okay? Um, so small, uh, spoiler alert, if you, if you wish, then uh, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna eventually get to the point that in fact, uh, the PDE in general doesn't even have C1 solution. And it only has Lipschitz viscosity solution. Okay, whatever the words I'm talking about, you know, don't worry. But what I mean is that the, the key point is that, okay, we are reducing from, you see that we are starting from C2 and I'm trying to ask you the question to reduce it to C1 and we're gonna prove this. But then, you know, the PD doesn't have C1 solution. And if it's not C1, then how do we define DU and stuff like that? Then, you know, it turns out it's only has Lipschitz and viscosity solution. Uh, we're gonna talk about that later. And that's why the questions about describe all solution is extremely important. And again, I want to emphasize that it's really not known when H is not convex. And it's really of interest if some of you here have ideas to develop a whole, you know, beautiful theory for it. It's, 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 it's gonna be great, okay? Um, so now let me end the lecture and then we can have time for discussion is that uh, there's certain heuristic discussion of large time behavior uh, of solution to the Cauchy problem. Okay, so this is this is the Cauchy problem. You have uh, W T plus H of X D W equal to zero in the torus, and you start with certain initial condition W X zero equal to G of X on the torus. And the question also of interest is what is the last time behavior of W X T as T goes to infinity? Okay. 
um, this is related to certain stability questions and you know even just from a very pure pd language the questions about about lifetime behavior for any kinds of pde is it's really important and um, it's not easy at all it's it's it's, it's actually quite hard depending on the setting nevertheless um, in this case that 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 uh, we're gonna okay so we will we will prove last time behavior by the end of our class uh, our our um, uh, 807. <laughs> Okay, I don't know when, um, but I'll try to really prove it. Um, so lifetime behavior, this, this kind of question were addressed a long, long time ago. And but it was only proved, uh, only proved uh, in, in many different ways. Why uh, from say 1998, 1999 up to now, okay? So you see that this is really a simple but remarkable question. Um, and it took people, you know, a long time from the starting point of KM theory that was done by Komogorov, Arnold, Moser, you know, after the second world war. And then, you know, development of viscosity for hamilton jacob equations in the early 80s. But this kind of last time behavior question were only proved in essentially 2000. Um, so mainly 20 years ago. And one has to use uh, certain deep dynamical properties uh, you know, from weekend theory or some other aspects to prove the result. It's just not simple at all. So the last time behavior result is gonna be that we're gonna guess that W is of the separable form. Why, you know, again, it's just a matter of educated guess. You know, you plug in certain ansatz. Sometimes it can be traveling waves. Sometimes it can be solitons or various different ways. In our setting here, we guess an ansatz that is of separable form, you know, like separable in X and T. So you guess it's of the form U X minus CT. If you guess it of exactly that form, then you plug in the equation, right? Uh, if it's like that, then if you have WXT is of the form like UX minus CT, then, you know, WT would be minus C, right? And DW would be DU. Therefore, if you have that, you plug in the PDE, you have exactly the equation H of X DU equal to C in the torus. And this is one of the reasons why I meant that this, um, Stationary PDE comes from um, comes also from study the study of last time behavior, um, and 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 there are many proofs up to now, very different flavors. Some are very neat. Uh, I'll probably only be able to present to you one proof that is relevant to what we are doing, but but we we will see if time permits and we can do other things as well. Uh, so we do have time for questions or discussions. Any concerns or any point you want to discuss or whatever, you know. I I have a question. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, finding all solutions is extremely important. Yeah. And I think that's uh, a side of PDE. And my question is. Uh, do different solutions give different dynamics? Uh, so that's a, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> uh, so it turns out that there are certain invariant sets called either you know, the RB set or the Mathen set that we're gonna dealt with that telling us that solutions behave differently uh, and uh, depending on exactly that that their behaviors on certain invariant set, uh, then you know they can be very different in the invariant set, and then each of that gives you a different dynamics. 
therefore, therefore, there's a strong interplay, as you have seen already, that there's a strong interplay between between the PDE and and, and the dynamics. And uh, and we we can more or less describe all of that in the context setting. And this is actually the main goal of this this big chapter and the main goal of our whole course. I will I will bring all of that to you, um, hopefully. Uh, uh, but okay, to understand very deeply about the dynamics and how difference between uh, different solutions is still not very clear up to this moment. Okay, there you know there there are various questions. For example, uh, it's a little bit controversial. There are something called anode diffusion and stuff like that. Uh, that is not clear whether it's proved up to now. There are certain groups who claim that they have proved it. You know, um, it is believed to be a very important problem, and up to this moment, it's still not clear what's the outcome. You know, um, yeah, but um, yeah, but 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 I can say that in the up to the abstract level, we do understand. Uh, going deeper, not yet. Okay, so then at least the Aubrey mother, uh, Aubrey mother mm -hmm. theory is about that. Is, is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other concerns or questions? So, I mean, um, let's see, what should I, uh, what should I tell you? Um, yeah, maybe let me tell you a, 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 a fun example before we end. Uh, so just to show that it's very, it's a very delicate question, okay? So, um, that's okay. Um, so I, I should have told you, well, we, so we're gonna, we will prove last time behavior. I'm, I'm just rewriting what I wrote. Behavior under the assumptions here. Uh, again, up to this moment, we have very, some very different need PD proof. Uh, really beautiful i don't know if i can describe it to you um, because time really is restricted in our whole class but but i want to bring up a point that if we uh we don't require uniform convexity then then last time behavior fails Okay, so we really need to require um, that the Hamiltonian is, is uniformly convex. Okay, so here's the example. Here's the tau example. This is by uh, Bars, T. Bars, and Suganidis, the top expert in the field. T. Bars is in France, Takis Suganidis is at U Chicago around 2000, it's a very simple example, which is only 2000 to the one. Uh, so you look at this, this very, uh, okay, let, let's see if I can do it right. So you look at this very simple, OD, UT plus UX plus one minus one equal to zero in uh, T cross zero infinity. Okay, very simple PD, right? Uh, first order is convex, in P, right? P is UX. Um, and I will put in some condition for UX. Zero equals to uh, whatever, sine or cosine, sine of X. Okay, you can correct me later in T. Okay, I'm, I'm being lazy here. So my torus is, is two pi periodic, you know, whatever, pi. Okay, so then you can find that the solution gonna be 
u x t if i'm not mistaken is going to be what it's going to be sine of x um sine of x and a differentiated cosine minus t i believe because if you differentiate in t you have minus cosine of x minus t right your x is uh cosine of x minus t and you plug in you have it solved the pd the plus one here is just a technical point so that when you take the absolute value is to be non-negative and then yeah Right, so it solves the PD. It's a traveling wave, you know, right? So, well, yes, it's a traveling wave. So in this case, then, then you see that the behavior is, 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 is not of separable form, right? It's, it's not like UX minus CT anymore. It's, it's a traveling wave. Uh, and, and you see that uh, sine of X minus T, if you take T goes to infinity, is does not converge, right? Does not exist. It's oscillating between minus one and one. So you see that although that I'm convex, but not uniformly convex or strictly convex, and I don't have large time behavior. So it's really, really a subtle issue. This is why that, you know, what we are doing is, you know, I'm already telling you an example just 20 years ago. So this leads to another big open question in general. Again, I'm throwing a lot of stuff uh, uh, out, but again, hopefully you guys can see a big uh, open, you know, a big open uh, field, you know, various different sub fields. And, and the big open question is that, okay, I'm just writing down a very general form. Uh, general PD, U, T plus F of X, uh, let's not write T, E, U, D square of U equal to zero in Pn plus in zero infinity, um, u x zero equal to g of x on the torus, then when and when not, can we have large time behavior? This is actually a big open question and there are many problem of interest, for example, you know, you can take f x b u d square of u. A, a one of the problem that is uh, close to my interest, and one of the problem is, is really open is that when you take it to be a front propagation nature, so it's a whatever that is. Is uh, it's a mean curvature flow type. For example, or other things. This is not convex in P. Whatever again. Uh, this is mean curvature. Um, we're not going to talk about that. But 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 I just want to tell you that 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 uh, it's already related to many many interesting questions, and this is not understood at all in general. There's there's no no nothing guarantee that you have uh, large time behavior. Uh, you know, or you can you know. Put a soft one here or something. Yeah. So uh, and this question is really of interest because they come from different different setting, front propagations or, or some other kind of equations. Um, I guess to say not convex in the view. Um, and 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 you know I would be very happy if some of you here can you know answer either this kind of question or the previous one about about developing a theory for understanding the set of solutions to the PD. Uh, so we, we're gonna touch up on everything slowly and gently. And I hope that you bear with me that I just throw at you certain PDs and I just assume that they are natural. They are not. But you know, once we get used to that then they are natural. Okay. Any other concerns or okay, so thanks a lot. Um, I'll see you guys again on Friday. Um, you know, stay safe and healthy as always. Bye for now. See you.
Sí.